Um, welcome to the Defense Innovation Unit webinar on how to pitch to the DIU. My name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rags Seltzer. I'm a uh, Air Force officer and a program manager in the autonomy portfolio at Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, we'll introduce uh, the other panelists here as they begin to speak. Uh, real quickly, why we're doing this webinar. First of all, we'll give you a little bit of an overview of who we are and what we do, why DIU exists, and what our process involves. But then really we wanted to share some best practices about how to succeed at our process and then open it up for your questions accordingly. As a disclaimer, this is not necessarily uh, what you must do or should do even, it's just ideas from a few of us that have seen the process uh, executed successfully uh, and unsuccessfully and, and trying to give you pointers so you can put your best foot forward uh, if and when you pitch to DIU. So that's it, I'm joined by uh, two uh, fantastic peers from DIU and I'll hand it off right now to Sarah Pearson. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Pearson, and I'm a contractor here at DIU, and I lead our commercial efforts for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, previous to DIU, I've spent time on the product side of companies like Google and GE, and I've even spent some time on active duty. Um, so we're super excited to be here today. It's a topic that I know many of you have reached out and inquired about. I think the best way to kick it off, though, is let's start with a little kind of who we are, what do we do to level set. So DIU, we are a fast-paced, agile DOD organization, and we contract with commercial companies to solve national security problems. All of our efforts across 100 plus uh, team members at this point really come down to three key missions. The first is to accelerate DOD adoption of commercial technology. The second is to utilize commercial technology to transform both our capacity and our capabilities within the department. And then third, we're ultimately here to strengthen the national security innovation base. One thing to keep in mind, GIU is the only DOD organization focused exclusively on fielding commercial technology at a speed, at speed that is relevant. Um, there are many amazing organizations and DIU is, is one of them, right? But we do touch the entirety of the DOD. So to provide a bit more context and dive deeper, um, we're gonna kick things off with a video. The United States government is the world's largest customer, providing reliable revenue for companies. In the past, barriers have made it difficult for commercial technology companies to work with the government such as complex bureaucracy, opaque processes, and slow progress. But today, that experience is different. The Defense Innovation Unit is the only Department of Defense organization focused on fielding and scaling commercial technology within the U.S. military across sectors. DIU helps minimize upfront costs, as well as reduce the time to award and ultimately facilitate full-scale production. We do this through streamlined and transparent processes, rapid decision-making, and scaling successful prototypes. Our process starts by soliciting commercial solutions on our website that address the current needs of our DOD partners. If you want to work with DIU, you must respond to an active solicitation on the website in which we seek a particular product or technology. If your technology is relevant to a specific solicitation, you'll simply send us a short brief in response. This brief should demonstrate the current capabilities of your company and how those could apply to the specified problem statement. We will reach out to you within 30 days to schedule a pitch if your technology is suitable. Your pitch should demonstrate your proposed solution and include an estimated cost. Companies with the best potential solutions to our DOD partners' needs are invited to negotiate a full proposal. Finalists are awarded a prototype contract within 60 to 90 days from start of process. The Defense Innovation Unit minimizes the time it takes from problem identification to prototyping a commercial solution and implementing it in the field. By connecting your company to this powerful DOD network, DIU's agile processes, contract authorities, and diverse team of experts can accelerate a path to revenue for your company. Learn more at diu.mil. All right, so that should give you an overview of what DIU 
is at a high level. If you're not familiar with us, I'm Dan Nidus. I'm a PM here at DIU with the AIML team and also the senior advisor for our advanced energy portfolio, which we stood up a little bit earlier this year. So also I'm a contractor just like Sarah. Before coming to DIU, I was at Tesla and before that uh, McKinsey and Company and spent some time, some more time in the commercial sector. And long before that, I was a United States Marine. So I think what I'm going to do here for just a minute is really just give you an idea kind of to transition from what DIU is to like what DIU does. And I think the most important thing that you should take away is that really we're an end to end prototyping partner to bridge the gap between the Department of Defense and the commercial sector. And so what I mean by that is we start by working with our partners throughout the DOD, whether in the services or the fourth estate, to really understand what their capability gaps or visions are, and to then scope that into an actionable prototype, go through the process of, of finding and connecting with the best that the tech industry has to offer, getting, getting a good company onto contract, and then partnering through the entire prototyping process pivoting as need be until we've got that successful prototype. And finally, going back to the end-to-end -end part, partnering with some of the traditional PEOs throughout the Department of Defense to transition that successful prototype into a program of record. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to give you a little bit deeper of a dive into our vendor submission and selection process. And after that, we're going to kind of go through a little bit more freewheeling best uh, best practices and advice for them. As Rag said at the beginning, what we've seen works well and what we've seen tends to not work so well. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. So double clicking into that middle chunk there, which is the commercial solution opening process for us. The CSO, as we call it, um, it's a competitive process and it's focused on selecting companies that are the best positioned to execute the project at hand. Internally, we progress to phase zero on the left-hand side there only after we've completed rigorous curation with our DOD partners. So similar to the curation efforts that your sales or biz dev teams would conduct, we ensure that one, the problem is addressable with commercial tech. Um, two, we ensure that there's funding, both short-term in terms of funding a prototype, but then also longer term. So if that prototype is successful, who and how can we fund this um, in, the, in the longer term? And then the third piece is evaluating for scalability. So within the DoD, there are traditionally many, many users that would benefit from a new technology or a new platform. So we work really hard to make sure we've got a lot of those users in the same room so uh, they can all benefit from our prototyping efforts. Once all that curation is complete, that's when we roll into phase zero here. So phase zero, we kick it off by posting a problem statement. Um, we call this an area of interest and we throw it, we post it up to our website. It's a concise overview of the problem, as well as a few characteristics, capabilities, and constraints that the solution must take into consideration. Um, I will note though, across the six portfolios we have, there can definitely be variants in terms of how broad or how narrow the problem statements are scoped. So it's hard to do a, kind of a one size fits all. Our AOIs are not requirement docs. So for people that are accustomed to the, the, the federal space, they're not requirement docs. What we want to hear is how you've solved this type of problem um, or how you would solve this type of problem based on your technology, your commercial technology. We typically leave the problem statements up for two weeks. Again, there's variance. I will offer though, we've, you know, we love feedback as an organization. And one of the key feedback points we've received over the last six to nine months was that two weeks was pretty short for most companies. So we've been playing around with extending that out a little bit. Um, so you'll see different times, but generally two to three weeks is pretty average. So in response to the AOIs, companies submit a solution or capability brief. Um, these briefs can take a few different formats. You can either do a five written page format or you can do up to 15 slides. Um, by design, the response should be low lift. Uh, we are trying to attract unconventional companies into the innovation base. So supposed to be low lift and it should include information that most commercial companies would have readily available. We'll get into that piece a little bit later. 
The most important element, though, in your solution brief is illustrating how your existing technology could address either portions of the problem or the whole thing um, that's scoped in the AOI. So that's phase zero. At the, when, that, what, when the solicitation comes off the website, we wrap up that phase and we progress to phase one. Phase one is our solution brief evaluation phase. This is a joint effort between the DIU team and our end user team, we keep referring to as our DOD partners, and we evaluate each of the solution briefs based upon four key things. The first is the relevance to the problem that we've stated in the AOI. The second is the technical merit of the capabilities outlined in that brief. The third is how innovative or compelling the proposed capability or solution is. And then the fourth is viability of the company. Phase one concludes when government partners, our government partner and our government acquisition officers make final decisions on which vendors will progress to phase two. Generally speaking, this phase takes two to four weeks um, and that can vary based on availability, the number of evaluators we have and ultimately the number of solution briefs that can reach 120 plus for some of our solicitations, especially in the AI ML space that Dan and I know um, in and out. So phase two, which is the most exciting, um, according to Sarah, is the company pitches, right? So historically these have been live pitches. Naturally we had to pivot to virtual over the last year. Um, the pitches typically run between 45 minutes and an hour and a half. And they're a mix of a company presentation and Q and A. During these, during these pitches, rather, companies will have access not just to the DIU team, but then also the end users. So it's a fantastic opportunity to better understand the problem and do a bit of your own curation and problem solving uh, during that discussion. Down selection decisions at this phase are, again, led by our government partners and the appropriate acquisition officers, and they take many things into consideration. Some of them are rough order of magnitude, prototype pricing, how much is this going to cost? Um, implementation and delivery schedule. How long will it take? Data, IP rights, company viability. Again, we want to make sure we're introducing healthy companies to the innovation base. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to that company's commercial technology and their ability to address the problem statement. There are a few potential outcomes from this phase, um, with phase two here. The first is the most well-suited company advances to phase three. I'll just get to in a second. The second is for companies that meet all the requirements but exceed the resources we have available, we place them into a portal for up to 180 days to potentially progress to phase three should more funding become available, should negotiations with one of the other vendors fall through, or if new DOD partners or users join, join the team. Right? And then the third avenue is non-select. At both phase one and phase two, you hear from DIU, you hear from members of our team, and they'll let you know if you are selected or not. And we really strive to get that back to you in a timely manner because we know tying up resources and efforts isn't helpful for anybody. That whole phase, phase two, generally takes two to three weeks. Uh, again, varying on number of companies that we have, number of evaluators, et cetera. We then progress to phase three, which is our request for pilot proposal. So in this phase, DIU and our DOD partners, we negotiate with those selected companies that progressed over key things like proposals um, and in their T's and C's, billing milestones, IP data rights, et cetera. And then we work together on a statement of work. It's important to note that you don't have to have any prior experience selling into the federal space. You don't even have to have a federal sales team. DIU, our end customer, and the company all work together um, on, on really each of these documents. I do want to note, though, that there can be slight variations in this process based on the contracting shop that we use. The whole process from posting the AOI to signing prototype contracts can range. The video shared 60 to 90 days. Occasionally, we get pretty backlogged and can get just a, a hair above that. Um, but in average, it's a three, four months. So now we're going to get into the meat of it, which is probably why you all joined, which is understanding those best practices around solution briefs. Again, solution briefs is that response to phase zero. So that's what we're going to click into first. 
Dan, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to turn over to you. Um, Dan, as a PM, has spent so much time evaluating company after solution brief after solution brief. So what are your thoughts in terms of best practices? Yeah, I think we, we've we got a few. And I think one thing I'll point out is the good thing about having kind of the group that you've got on here, you've got a couple of different portfolios represented. You've got a couple of different lenses represented from the PM to the commercial executive side. So I think over this, you're going to get some different, you know, a collection of different experiences that will hopefully inform you and give you a better idea of, you know, what are some things you can do to, you know, hopefully submit better solutions. I think for the initial written brief, I mean, the biggest single thing that I'd say to take away is you've got to address the problem in the AOI. And what I mean by that is this, you know, this definitely isn't a FAR-based RFP. We're not looking, you know, like Sarah said, this isn't a long, exhaustive list of requirements, but those AOIs are going to describe a problem, a problem that we want to have solved. And sometimes those problems will be pretty broad and generally scoped. And sometimes they'll be a little bit more specifically scoped. But the key thing is you've got to address that problem. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we'll see sometimes a event, a potential vendor submit a proposal that really is essentially just their generic pitch deck. They're in their generic, hey, who you, here is who you are as a company, and here are our commercial offerings. And unless it just happens to align perfectly with what the problem is, that essentially is asking the evaluation team to do a bit of a mental jump and answer the question for themselves of, can this actually solve the problem? So long story short, help us bridge that gap from understanding these are these are the products that you offer. This is the service that you offer. And here is how it can solve the, the solution that we've posted on that AOI. And then I'll add to that a little bit, if that's all right. The, uh, you know, one of the keys in this initial solution brief submission, which again is only five page paper or 15 slide deck, is illustrating how your capabilities, your technology and your solution is, is real, right? And we wanna make sure that you're able to show us that it's not uh, a vaporware per se. So illustrating use cases of deployments that you've done, even if it's not the same solution you would provide to the AOI, something that's relevant and something that demonstrates competency of your company and the ability of you to, to generate technology that would be relevant with, with, a, uh, with a modification. Show those, show those use cases. It doesn't have to be government. In fact, we want to see a strong uh, commercial market opportunity for you as well. And that's kind of core to DIU's mission. So show us what you've done. Really build the case with some details about uh, who you worked with, what you built, um, and the, the success or the ins and outs of that effort. Uh, and make it make it real so that it's not uh, so we don't think it's just a white paper. We want to see what you can actually produce. Yeah, and I think another thing to keep in mind is oftentimes these AOIs they'll have multiple parts to them. So just to use kind of a generic example, you yeah you may see uh, machine learning you know what's something coming out of the AI portfolio that has several requirements and not requirements but several aspects to the problem that we're trying to solve. And that might sound like hey we need the solution to both ingest several different data sets. We need it to merge those together. And then we need it to do some form of analytics on the back end of it, maybe some kind of computer vision um, analysis, you know, some kind of object identification, something of that nature. And you as the vendor, you know, maybe you can do every aspect of that yourself. Maybe you can't, but I think there are two key, key things to think about here. One is address every aspect of what's in the problem. So if you say, hey, we're doing, we're really good at object identification inside of you know, still images, but you don't address the re anything of the rest of the AOI, then that makes it, that's not really a complete submission. It's like, wow, this is really compelling on one aspect, but it kind of, it, it has a chance of leaving evaluators thinking, but what will I do about the rest of this problem, the rest of this solution I'm trying to develop and deliver? One thing that we've seen increase, I'd say, over the last year is, is oftentimes submissions will include one slide that kind of has a list down the side of, hey, aspect one, one, capability one, two, three, four. And then they'll say, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. That's as a, if it's a matter of helping us identify which part of the problem your company can solve as an overview can be really helpful. But as a convincing argument that, yes, you can actually do that, 
as, as I'm sure you'd imagine, it's kind of terrible. You know, it's anyone, anyone can simply submit a PowerPoint slide that says, yes, we do this. Yes, we do this. Yes, we do this. I think the key thing with, to remember is this is really your argument to convince us that you're really capable of solving this. So to the point that Rags made, including one of the best ways to do that is show us real, real examples when you solve that or similar problems. We understand that if you're a commercial company and we're at now asking you to solve a defense to you know, modify your technology or solution to solve a defense specific use case, you might not have solved that specific use case, but you've probably got solved very similar ones for the commercial sector. And if you highlight examples of that, that's really helpful. Additionally, giving a little bit of detail of the, hey, this is one of the core require or one of the core aspects of the AOI. And this is specifically what from our suite of offerings we're going to use to do that is really good because that helps us connect the dots between how what you, that you're proposing to solve it and how you're proposing to solve it. Another piece to it's around viability. And I've said it a couple of times already. So I want to spell this out because it's a common question that comes up. Um, including information around your company, right? When were you founded? How many full-time employees, part-time contractors? What's your funding status? Have you taken external capital or have you bootstrapped the whole thing? Um, revenue size, always a good, even if it's just a ballpark that helps us better understand any inherent risk that there would be. Um, the other thing too, if you're in the hardware space, it's very helpful for us to understand things like your manufacturing capacity, right? What's the lead time on components and what is your mass? What's your mass pr max production capacity per month, right? Per year. So that's all really important. The other side to telling us about your company, which comes back a little bit to what I was saying around just information most companies have readily available, right? Low touch. Um, tell us about your team, right? Tell us about your leadership team, your technical team. What have they done? Um, why, are, why is this team of leaders uniquely positioned uh, to solve the problem that we've scoped? So don't hesitate to share that type of information. And please also know that it's never shared outside of all of us, you know, on the DIU side or the DOD partner evaluators and everybody's under an NDA as well. So um, I just wanted to hit that piece too. Just to build on that a touch, there's no, uh, no need to, to uh, embellish any of those facts, right? Obviously, before we enter into a contracting arrangement, we'll make sure that we're uh, very familiar with your company and the history and, and, and where it's going. So if you're, if you're pre-revenue, if you're a small company, obviously identify that and then just make sure to make a note of how you see going from that early stage to reaching uh, the, the scale that we would need for a, a fully developed production solution. I think one more piece I'll throw on is oftentimes, you know, kind of touching back to what I alluded to a little bit earlier, you might not be able to provide a solution for the entire problem that we're looking for on your own. And that's all right. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's not uncommon that we see submissions that are teams, you know, one company that's providing to for taking the lead and proposing the bulk of the solution, but which is going to team with a couple others to provide aspects of the solution. And that's one of the things that it's good. The more you can make it clear for us that that's what you intend to do, that removes uncertainty around what I was talking about earlier, which is the, hey, they talked a lot about this part of the problem. They didn't talk at all about this part of the problem. So the more you can fill that in, the better. So Acknowledging, just like Rags talked about with, hey, acknowledge that you're an early stage or pre-revenue company or whatever the case may be. Also acknowledge the fact that you're going to provide this part of a solution. And hey, you're going to partner with someone to provide the other parts of the solution that you don't have as an in-house capability. That's good. Even better would be if you've actually, say, know who exactly you're going to partner with and you're able to specify that hey, we're going to provide a great machine vision solution and we're going to partner with this company that is going to do kind of the data and just merge and cleaning for us. Yeah, that's even better. And take it a step further and it, let us know if, you act, if this is a new relationship you're building or if it's one that you have a habitual working relationship as well. Everything, it's, it's really, I think, at the end of the day, when you think about these submissions, there's a there's two things to keep in mind. One is it's a balancing act. This shouldn't be something that you're investing hours and hours and hours 
of your life and your team on. Like I said, it's not a far based thing. This should be, frankly, oh, I don't know, maybe one hour, maybe two at the most. But at the same time, it's also not just recycle your generic pitch deck, your generic sales deck. So it's taking that time to really give us something that explains how you and your team are well suited to solve the problem that we're looking for. And then with that, it's also a matter of the striking that right balance between, hey, here's the general overview of who we are and what we offer and giving us enough information to really make a compelling argument for yourselves that makes the evaluation team think, wow, these folks really seem like they've got a credible capability that's exciting and could really address this problem. We want to hear more from, from them. So as mentioned, that's really part of phase one. Phase two then are all of those virtual, um, all your virtual pitches. So what are your thoughts? Dan, we'll start with you again. What are your thoughts in terms of best practices in this area? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing here is, and it's a little bit of a, a variation of the theme that we were talking about with the submissions, but it's understand that this is not a pitch to a VC company. This is not the hey, we want to sell DIU on our vision, the expertise in our founding team, the, our, our product market fit. We're not, we're not here to invest in you per se and invest in the company's ultimate success like in the same way that a VC would. We're here to get a problem solved. And so your pitch so, should really reflect that. And again, reflect how you and your team are going to solve the problem that we originally posted on the AOI. And I, I just really bring this up because we see it time and again. And I think about, yeah, one, about one example in particular a couple of years ago where phenomenal company, pretty sure they could have been a great partner to solve this problem, but they came in for the pitch and spent 45 minutes talking about the, the founder's vision for the company and what, where that vision came from and the, the problem space at writ large and why the solution that they're offering is poised for you know, mega growth. And it, it was fascinating. It was really interesting. If I was doing it from a VC lens, I probably would have put money in. Unfortunately, there was nothing in that pitch to make me think it actually they even addressed the problem, frankly, much less convince us that they were, they were a credible solution to it. And it was, it was disappointing to see. And you know, I think if you remember one thing, try to take that away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just demonstrating an appreciation and understanding for the problem primarily and then getting into how you would approach the solution. Just zooming out for a second on the actual um, execution of these these pitches, uh, as Sarah alluded to, they've been virtual for the last year. Uh, historically, they've been in person, and that can change the dynamic just a little bit. So uh, with the virtual pitches, because of the unrestricted size of the virtual room, you may see as many as 20 to 40 or even more people on the other side of the line. Um, in person and in some of the virtual pitches, it could be as little as half a dozen. The, uh, the team that'll be reviewing, uh, observing and asking questions in your pitch will be a mix of DIU members as well as uh, government representatives that are our DIU partner, the people that are funding the project. Excuse me. That'll be everybody from program management like me and Dan to commercial executives like Sarah, as well as technical SMEs, which we have on staff at DIU, and then the same on the customer side. So you'll have technical SMEs, programmatics, uh, et cetera. So uh, expect to field a wide variety of questions, but also just be prepared to present information that would be relevant across that set of stakeholders. When you even double click into that, you bring up such a good point, Mike, on the virtual element here. You know, running through, if you're going to share videos, which are an amazing tool uh, to help showcase your capability, making sure that those are going to run, especially if you have 40 people across disparate locations. Um, so just making sure, as we all know by now, the virtual environment and some of the nuances there. I think Rags brought up a good point, which is understanding the audience and understanding that it is going to be a mix of folks. It's going to be part of the DIU team. It's going to be some of our partners from the DOD team, like he said. And just like this is going to include technical expertise, whether it's yeah, DIU's got a AIML tech diligence team that's going to be represented. You're going to have experts on the problem and the data from our DOD partners. Similarly, you should bring your right team. And again, it's another one of these common mistakes we see where the pitch team shows up and it's and it's only the business development folks. 
And at the first question they get of explain to me more about, about how your NLP model works, you get the pause, the, the kind of the nervous looks and the, well, we can get back to, we, you know, let us, let us consult our technical team, let us consult our CTO and we'll get back to you. So understand you're going to get a range of questions during these pitches that ranges from everything from how much is it going to cost programmatically? How do you propose to do this? A lot of it really is going to be a technical, a technical dive into how you propose the solution in convincing us that you and your solution, your offering can credibly solve this technical solution. And say just another part on that is circling back to the earlier point that I made about bringing, about letting us know in the written submission, if you're going to be using teaming, if you're going to be using a team, bring the team to the pitch as well. If you're depending on a couple of team members from another company to provide a third half the solution, and they're not there to talk about a, they're not there to talk about it. That's going to significantly undercut your ability to convince the evaluating team that A, you've even got a credible teaming arranged teaming set up, and B, whether or not that partner can deliver on their portion of it. On one of the dues, we have provided live demos. I just want to hit on that for a second. That that may be requested explicitly by the by the DIU team uh, when they describe the the goals of the phase two pitch, and it may not. In either case, it's highly recommended to provide a demonstration back to that original point of, of kind of proving out your technologies as best you can. Now that can be recorded, uh, of course, or uh, ideally it would be a live run of software or live video of hardware, whatever the, the case may be. We understand that often those demos have, have hiccups, but that's fine. We still wanna see uh, your, your technology in action um, and, uh, and that may be requested explicitly at times, but again, you're highly encouraged to do that even when it's not directly requested. Within uh, AI ML lens here, we even share sample data for some of our problem sets. Getting back to the, that mission in terms of introducing commercial technology, this is technology that has already been developed and deployed in the private sector for most of our use cases, right? So we're not looking for a highly tailored you know, customizable platforms, just ingest the data set that we've shared and show us how you could build and then execute on those models or whatever the use case is. Um, that's one AI ML spin too. Yeah, I think I just can't, I can't reinforce the demo piece enough. Sometimes like Sarah says, we'll explicitly request it. Sometimes we won't, but even when we don't, if you can do it, do it. Maybe it's live, if you can do a live demo, amazing. Sometimes just due to the nature of pro certain prototypes, it may not be able to be live. So even then, do a recorded one if you can. I think one of the, again, going back to some of the better pitches I've seen, I think back to one where it was an AI ML one. We didn't provide them any sample data, but simply from the information that they had from the AOI release, as well as some amplifying information we sent them, they were able to understand enough about what we were getting at that they went out and that a, the vendor went out and found an equivalent open source data set that they think approximated the type of problem we were looking at and trained up a model on that. And they were able to present us that during the pitch. Overall time investment probably wasn't terribly much on their part, probably a few hours and probably a few hours over several different days, but there's nothing for making convincing argument that we can solve your problem by demonstrating how you've solved our problem or something close to it. Excellent. And then just, you know, maybe one last point here before we get into the, the closing comments and the Q and A is make sure you hit the, the required items. Uh, they're outlined in the CSO documentation that we can share on request, but it's also right there on the, on the screen on the right. So providing a rough order magnitude uh, for cost in this case, Realize that this is not this is not binding. We're not we're not going to hold your feet to the fire necessarily. If there's deviations uh, from that initial ROM, it just gives us a, a good ballpark and, and kind of an initial uh, point of departure for subsequent discussions. We wouldn't expect uh, our team to provide a budget available, so just provide an honest uh, rough order cost of of what you've proposed. The scope may change subsequently, and that's fine. Uh, same thing about timeline. Be honest with the timeline. Pro uh, period of performance extensions are are not guaranteed in these situations. So we wanna make sure that uh, what we sign up to do in a given period of time, we can actually accomplish that. We don't wanna roll right 
Uh, we want to get things done quickly and, and effectively. And then finally, one of the nice things about the contract mechanisms that we use is there is a little bit of flexibility with respect to data rights and intellectual property. Um, so that would be a time to you know, make any assertions, initial assertions that you, that you may have or desires you may have from, a, from an IP standpoint. And we're happy to work with you. And we think that we want you to keep your IP and be a successful commercial company as much as possible. And, um, and, and again, that's a, that's a benefit of working through this mechanism. Um, all right. Well, I, I think those are our do's and don'ts for the pitch. Um, Sarah, if you want to take it home with closing comments, then we can get into the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a couple of things. One, if you take one thing away from this conversation, it's no two problem sets are the same. The same way, there's no right way to submit a solution brief, right? These were just guidelines, our observations over the last handful of months or years. Um, the second thing too is we're just continuing to gain momentum. So since uh, creation, right, founded in 2015, so coming up on our six year anniversary, we've obligated nearly 700 million in funding, I think 640 million in funding. And that just continues to grow year after year. So there are plenty of opportunities and we're working hard to bring even more to the table. The goal today was to arm you with some of those best practices, um, just setting you up well to showcase both your company and your technology. The other thing I want to know and hit on it earlier is feedback. We are all about process improvement. So if you have thoughts along the way, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Um, it's, a, it's a key piece in our process. So keep an eye on our website. As I mentioned, that is where we post all of our AOIs or solicitations. And we all look forward to reading proposals here soon.